of Christ. Um, but we are now we're thinking about we are God's people. So uh, let me lead us in prayer as we start our afternoon study. Father, we thank you for those that you've used in our lives uh, to draw us closer to you, to uh, call us to our various roles in your great mission, to uh, redeem a people for your glory, for your name, from all the peoples of the earth, and to bring glory to yourself through the redemptive work of Christ. We thank you for your word, and we now again ask you for open ears and open hearts to hear what you have to teach us as you teach us the answer to the question, who are we? We are the people of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, I think one of the things that, in general, Africa understands better than America is the answer to the who am I question really depends on the answer to the who are we question. We've been so ingrained with individualism, with my right to choose who I am. Of course, these days, it's my right to choose what gender I feel like I am today. Uh, we've been so ingrained with this I, 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 that we've forgotten that really the answer to who I am is really, in many ways, defined by who we are. To whom do I belong? And I, my impression, you... Some of you have lived in Africa your whole lives. Some of you have served in Africa. My impression is that African society in general gets it, that we belong in a network of relationships. And that's really what helps to define who we are. People of God certainly is one of those concepts. It's one of those truths. Uh, this morning we looked at the fact that we are exiles because we have a different homeland. As Israel had a homeland in the land of promise, but it was a homeland that could be destroyed, could be lost. We have a heavenly homeland that defines who we are. But being people of God is more than just having a place to call home. It's being in relationship with God. When the Lord called his people out and led his people out of slavery in Egypt, he led them to Mount Sinai. Why? It was, well, Jeremiah says it was the wedding. Uh, it was the marriage of the Lord to Israel when they exchanged their vows. And when the Lord, just before he delivered the Ten Commandments, when he came down on the mountain in the fire and in the smoke and in the terrifying earthquake and the sound, the sound of the trumpet, just before he gave the Ten Commandments, he said to Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And, of course, over and over again, we read in the books of Moses, much later in the Old Testament, this great covenant promise, this commitment promise, I will be your God. You will be my people. Leviticus 26, one example. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Peter gathers that theme, together with some other titles that we're going to look at in this session, in these two verses uh, here in the middle of chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And the, the amazing thing, remember their background we heard this morning, the amazing thing, he says this 
he applies these glorious titles to people, as he says, in, who inherited from previous generations a pattern of living that was devoted to chemical abuse, sexual exploitation, and idolatry. And now he says, you are God's people. You are a holy nation. You have not a drop of Abrahamic DNA in you. If you did Ancestry.com, it wouldn't show anywhere on the pie chart that you are biologically related to Abraham. But you are Abraham's children. You are the people of God. Amazing, amazing. And as you see here, he really applies to us five titles. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession. And then really he comes back to one of them, but I'm counting it as number five. Once not a people, now the people of God. Once not having received mercy, now having received mercy. So we're going to look at four of those today. We're going to save holy priesthood for tomorrow because it connects with some things that Peter had already said in chapter 2, uh, that particular privilege to stand between the Lord and people who need intercession, people who need someone to bring them close to God, the way we need Jesus to be our great high priest. I think Ken might mention that a few more times in the next couple days, right? Uh, the great high priest who brings us close to God. Well, that is a special role that because we are in Christ, we get to have. But that we're going to save for tomorrow. So let's just look at these four then. Chosen race is the first one. You see, actually, in our, verse, in our verses here, he talks about race and nation and people. Different words in English, different words in Greek, and reflective of different words back in Hebrew as well, since many of these are titles from the Old Testament brought by Greek translation through the Septuagint translators into the Greek that all the nations spoke when, uh, at least around the Mediterranean world, when the New Testament was given. Um, little different nuances. Race is a term that's kind of related to Greek verbs for beginning or for becoming or begetting. So it has this idea of origins, of what are your roots. Uh, that's one theme. Nation is the term uh, that often is the same Greek term as often translated Gentiles, because it's often in the New Testament referred to people groups that are not the Israelite, the people of God group. Um, we hear nation, we think geopolitical boundaries. We think government systems. We think armies. The ancient Greek speakers would hear ethnos or ethne, and they would hear much what we hear in our English loan word, ethnic. Uh, a people who may or may not be related in terms of roots, but who share a culture, probably share a language. Uh, and typically, often in the New Testament, although not in this place, referring specifically to those people that are not close to God, the Gentiles, the outsiders. And then people is kind of like race and kind of like nation, but it has a little bit more of this sense of personal connection, uh, that the answer to who am I is really who are we. And particularly in the way the Bible uses it, personal connection with God, a people in covenant with God. So often in the New Testament, you'll find the ethne, Gentiles, nations, contrasted with the laos, the people, the people of Israel. Um, fascinating text over in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John have been called on the carpet by the leaders of Judaism and told they're not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They go back to the church, they report what's happened, and the church just goes into prayer. And when the church goes into prayer, what they do is quote to the Lord his word. They quote from Psalm 2. Why do the nations, ethne, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Now, in the context 
the original context in which David wrote the psalm, the nations and the peoples are pretty much interchangeable there. He's talking about those enemy nations who hate the Lord and his Messiah. But when the church quotes this verse, they do something very interesting. They say, you know, the nations rage, the peoples plot in vain, the, ruler, the kings of the earth oppose God and the rulers gather together. And then when they comment on it, by way of commentary, they say this, Lord, you've really kept your word. Because truly in this city, Jerusalem, were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, Messiah anointed, both Herod, who claimed to be a king, he was a minor king, Herod Antipas, he wasn't like his dad, great King Herod, but he was a king, and rulers, Pontius Pilate, they named by name, the Roman governor who handed Jesus over to the crowd, along with the ethne, the Gentiles, and the peoples of Israel. The people who are in covenant with God, but he, they don't use tribes. There's another word for that in Greek, but they don't use that. The peoples of Israel who are in covenant with God conspired with the ethne, the outsiders, to put Jesus to death. Lord, you kept your word. So now that we're being threat, they go threatened, as, uh, as those who opposed the Messiah were threatened, uh, threatened uh, and did away with Jesus. Now, Lord, interesting, their prayer doesn't end the way I might have. Uh, they've been reading the Bible, so they don't say, now, Lord, you'll understand why we can't preach anymore. <laughs> they don't do that. Now, Lord, consider their threats and give us boldness because we know you're in charge we can read Psalm 2, we've lived through its fulfillment, and now we've got the peoples of Israel in their leaders opposed to your Messiah. Just give us boldness and keep on bringing people into the kingdom of your son. So, beautiful, beautiful. So those are the terms, and they're kind of interchangeable, uh, but Peter starts with chosen race. Your roots are in God's choice, in God's election. Some people get nervous when we talk about God's election. I hope you don't in here. If you do, you're very uncomfortable with the Rafiki Bible study in a lot of places <coughs> uh, because the Bible talks about God choosing. This is actually the first word that Peter used to describe us in this letter. We are elect exiles chosen exiles, chosen by God. Why did God choose us? Well, 1 Peter 1, 1 says we were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of blood by Jesus Christ. Now, some people hear foreknowledge and they think, ah, okay, well, God chose us because he knows everything and he knows the future and so he looked from eternity past, before creation, he looked down into history and he said, now there's somebody who's going to believe. I think I'll choose them. There's somebody who's going to be open to the gospel. I think I'll choose them. No, no, no. No, no. Foreknowledge is an okay translation, but if you think foreknowledge means advanced information, that's not the way the Bible uses the term. Without the four part, the Bible uses the term knowledge, not just for information, but for intimate knowledge. Like in Genesis 4, Adam knew his wife Eve. That doesn't mean he went over and said, hello, what's, my, what's your name? He knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. It's that term that in biblical terminology is, is a discreet way to talk about miracle intimacy. In Amos, God says to his rebellious people, you only have I known among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. That's Amos 3, verses 1 and 2. He's not saying, obviously, you're the only nation on earth I had any information about. He's saying, I, I set my love on you. I made covenant with you. I made the choice to bring you 
into communion with myself. And because you've spurned it, you're throwing away this great, great gift that I have lavished upon you. Same thing we find, you can't go there, time is short. Romans chapter 8, those whom God foreknew, those whom God loved in advance, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Not a few of those, all of those that God foreloved, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And then he called them, and then he justified them, and then he, he glorified them. Paul just goes right to the end. No loss, no spillage from one step to another in the love of God. From the beginning when he set his love on us before we were, through the call, through the justification, because the Spirit has given us faith to respond to the call to trust in Jesus so we're declared right with God and all the way to glorification. For knowledge, for love. So why did God for love us? Because he saw something about us? Well, the pattern of Israel certainly shows us it's not that. In fact, in Deuteronomy, the Lord belabored belabored the fact that he had chosen them and loved them in spite of who they were, not because of who they were. It certainly wasn't because they were big and strong and a world power. He says in Deuteronomy 7, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. We'll hear that in a few minutes. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you, but because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers. And in case any Israelite thought, well, okay, it's not because we're that big, but it is because we're really pretty righteous. Two chapters later in Deuteronomy, two chapters later, Deuteronomy 9, do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust out the pagan nations from the land of promise, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. This is Deuteronomy 9.4 and the following verses. It's amazing. Because he doesn't say it one time. He says it three times. Don't think it's about you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of those people, I'm going to throw them out. Know that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. It's not only not because of your righteousness, but it's in spite of the fact that God knows how stiff your, your neck is and how stiff your heart is. So it's not about that. And it's the same for everyone who belongs to Christ. It's not because God foreknew how pleasing we were, how choice we were, that he chose it. No. Uh, Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, remember your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards or powerful or of noble birth. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, what is weak in the world to shame the strong, what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to bring things that are to nothing. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Or what Paul says in in Romans 5, while we were still weak. And then he goes a little further. No, actually, while we were still sinners, God set his love on us, and Christ died for us. So why did God choose us? Because he loved us, and he chose us in Christ, who is truly choice and chosen. So Peter says about Jesus in 1 Peter, back to 1 Peter here, in chapter 1, verse 20, Jesus was foreknown. That's not just advanced information. That's the Father treasuring and loving the Son. Foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, you who through him are believers in God. And as we'll hear tomorrow morning, or tomorrow afternoon, I think it is, uh, we come to Christ who is the living stone who is chosen and precious, of great value to the Father. He's the chosen one. The Father has graciously put us in Christ, tied us in to Christ. From all eternity, he's given us to Christ. 
and now we belong to him, so we're chosen in him. So how does that identity impact how we see ourselves? Well, first it humbles us, doesn't it? We take no credit for the fact that we believe and somebody else doesn't. Because it wasn't because we were so righteous or insightful uh, or even humble. It's all of God's love. And of course that was Paul's point when he wrote to the Corinthians. Don't start getting puffed up and thinking God chose you because you're just the prime. It's not that. So it humbles us. But the other thing is, it greatly assures us because it shows us that knowing the worst about us, God has loved us and chosen us. We never have to fear that he's going to discover some hidden, shameful secret about us and say, oh, if I'd known that about you, <laughs> the deal's off. No. He knows the worst about us. I know I've used this illustration before, but some of you haven't been here before. Jane and I love murder mysteries. Uh, we love to read about Lord Peter Whimsey. Dorothy Sayers, a friend of C.S. Lewis, wrote those. And in a book that Dorothy Sayers did not finish, but was finished for her, Thrones Dominations, Lord Peter and his fairly newlywed wife, Lady Harriet Vane, who was a bit cynical and distrusting of him until he finally won her heart, turns to her, he turns to Harriet, and he says, you have unmasked me and loved me all the same. Many husbands can say that with great gratitude to their wives. They know us, and they love us anyways. But if that's true of a loving marriage, it's infinitely more true. God has unmasked us and loved us all the same. So the fact that God chose us, that we are a chosen race for the sake of his love, not our worthiness, assures us. And it unites us. Because he hasn't chosen us for something different about us. It really ties us all together with one another. Paul says in Colossians 3, he doesn't talk specifically about God's choice, but he's talking about the result of it, and that is that as believers, when God brought us to Christ, we took off the old man, that's our identity in Adam. Who am I in Adam? I'm a rebel who deserves exile. But God, by his grace, took that old, ugly garment off me, and we've been clothed with the new man, who is Christ, and in this new man, Paul says, there is not Jew or Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What unites us is not biological DNA or ancestry. What unites us is this gracious choice of God. For all the ways we may look different, for all the ways we may speak differently, from all the ways that we may have a different diet, we are united because of God's choice. Chosen race. Holy nation. Holy nation. You are a holy nation. God had chosen Israel to be a holy nation. He kept saying to them, be holy because I'm holy. I'm the Lord. I define your identity. Be holy. They weren't. So God gave a promise much later through a prophet, Ezekiel, speaking in the time of Israel's exile. Jeremiah we talk about as the prophet of the exile too, who gave the new covenant promise that Hebrews camps on in, in the heart, as Ken's going to probably show us. See, I don't really know what he's going to say. <laughs> but anyway, the promise of the new covenant, when God writes his word on the hearts of his people, Ezekiel the message that God gave to Ezekiel was this, I will gather you back, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. Just think, Ezekiel's a priest. So think of all the imagery that that brings to him about the rituals that he would have conducted at the, at the sanctuary. I will sprinkle clean water, you will be clean, I will cleanse you. And what did all that, what was all that about? Well, now he goes deeper. Just the way Hebrews shows us that the sacrifices were pointing to something deeper. I will give you a new heart. I will take out of you the heart of stone, resistant, obviously, to God's word. I will put into you a heart of flesh, tender to God's word. I will make you holy. I will make you 
holy. And Paul says in, in Ephesians 1 that God has chosen us in Christ that we should be holy and blameless in Christ. Notice that order. Not God chose you in Christ because he saw that you were holy and blameless, as though that were the condition for his choice. No, it's just the opposite. It's the purpose, and it's the inevitable result. He's chosen us in sheer grace, despite the fact, as Paul says in chapter 2 of Ephesians, we were dead in trespasses and sin. He chose us in order to make us holy in Christ. That is God's agenda for us. Now, what is holiness? I have four hours, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. What is holy? Well, it is separation from anything that defiles, from anything that is unclean, from any kind of moral malignancy. Um, it's, it's anything that would bring stain or dis disdain upon the name of God. It's separation. So it's partly lack of infection. Some of you joined us in prayer for our granddaughter who, 12 years ago, was diagnosed with a very unusual adult form, form of cancer in her right shoulder. And uh, the Lord used many, many means and answered many prayers to free Maya of malignancy. We were longing for clear scans, and the Lord has granted that. Uh, and we praise God for that. I probably told you about her uncle Eric when he was a baby, our firstborn, who had neonatal meningitis when he, a day after he was born. So he had an, a bacterial infection in his spinal fluid. And he spent his first month in the hospital. Now he was over 10 pounds, so he had a little bit of meat to work on. But God used antibac antibiotics, a, a, an experimental antibiotic, to free Eric. We were looking for clear blood work. Uh, holiness is clear blood work spiritually. It means no infection whatsoever. So it's separation, but it's separation not only from all the defiles, but also separation to all that conforms to the image of God. The Pharisees got the separation from part, kind of. Don't do this, don't do that. They counted the 613 laws in the Torah, and then they built a fence around the Torah so we don't come anything close to being unholy, allegedly. Uh, and yet, in their pride, they had violated the first commandment because they'd made themselves God instead of the Lord, really. That's really what they'd done. But they understood that separation concept, but they didn't get the reality that Jesus' holiness was beautiful and Jesus' holiness was contagious. Isn't that striking that when he touches a leper, instead of him contracting an uncleanness, the leper is cleansed? Instead of when he touches a dead body, him becoming ceremonially unclean, the dead come to life? Jesus is like that. So holiness is positive. And Peter makes that point, actually, in 1 Peter 1, verse 22. He says, having purified your souls by obeying the truth, so that's his way of saying by believing the gospel. He's not just talking about keeping rules, but obeying the truth of the gospel, having purified your souls for a sincere brotherly love, love each other strenuously, earnestly, from the heart. We need both sides of holiness. We need to make sure that we do stay away from anything that defiles, and we need to ask the Lord to protect us from that. In this last year, the ministry of a highly respected uh, apologist and defender of the Christian faith after his death was, well, the ministry imploded because the stories came out, true stories, that he was a sexual predator and others had covered up for it. I've served, filled the pulpit a few times for a church far away from Tennessee, which in the last year and a half has had first their senior pastor and then their associate pastor leave the ministry because of sexual sin. It happens. We need to ask the Lord to guard our hearts from anything, especially as we have children and youth in our care, anything, any desire that would ever, ever tempt us to exploit them or to do, behave in any way other than complete integrity and purity. 
So we need to stay away, but we also need to draw near in true love with pure hearts. So a holy, a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. This is a sweet one. A people that God loves and treasures. He said it in Exodus 19, you will be my treasured possession. At the very end of the Old Testament, he said it again through Malachi, uh, those who fear the Lord will be mine when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And before Malachi and Isaiah, Peter's probably thinking of this Isaiah passage because he's quoting not just the one statement, but others. He says, I give water in the wilderness. This is Isaiah 43, verses 20 and 21. Water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. I give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself. That's our English translation. It's pretty good. It could also be the people whom I acquired for myself. It could be formation, creation, or it could be redemption, purchase that they might declare my praise. See, Peter's going to go on to talk about declaring the praises. So I, I think Peter has that in mind. God has rescued us to make us a special treasure. I don't know if you have a special treasure. It's always a little risky to have some an object that's a special treasure that you don't want to lose, you don't want to miss. Um, I have a wedding ring that a young lady gave me 51 years and two weeks ago. Oh, did I mention that before? <laughs> I also have a watch that I inherited from my dad when the Lord took him home several years ago. And it's really kind of harder to see than the cheap Timex, but I still wear it. I still wear it. It's a treasured possession, right? And we are God's treasured possession. And when I read that, I, this is a little weird, I know, but I, I think of Gollum and the Lord of the Rings. It's, that's the twist you know, when Gollum loses his ring, my precious, my precious, it was, it was his whole life. And of course, it was a, an evil ring, and it was a ring that enslaved him, but it was a distortion of what is something very good to treasure. The Lord treasures us that way. And in fact, he deserves to be treasured by us in that way. We are his own possession for which he's paid the highest price. The Heidelberg Catechism teaches us that our only comfort in life and death is that we are not our own, but we belong body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he paid for all our sins. He paid for all our sins. Paul, it, Heidelberg is really quoting the Bible, you know. Paul says to Corinthian Christians, who are into exercising their freedom, all things are lawful for me, in all kinds of sexual promiscuity. And Paul says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Don't you know who owns you? Don't you know who treasures you? Don't you remember what he paid for you? We are God's special treasure. And the children, and the youth, and the widows, and the and the brothers and sisters in our village, all who, whom God has called and is calling to trust in Jesus are his special treasure to be treasured by us as well. And you notice Paul says here, uh, Peter says here, uh, we are his peop the people for his own possession, his special treasure, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Talk about his excellencies. That was the point in Isaiah 43, that God's special treasure are the people who love to declare his glory. Peter adds a little detail to it. Remember, he took you out of darkness into light. So he's probably thinking of passages like Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness now have seen a great light. Wonderful Christmas verse, right? Promise of the coming of Messiah. Or Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come. Darkness Covered the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise on you and his glory will be seen upon you and the nations will come to your light. Latin scholars, Reformation motto, post tenebras lux, which means after darkness, light. 
after darkness, light. And that's what these biblical texts are saying. And that's what our great reformers uh, thought when they, when they heard the word of good news, uh, of justification on the strength of Christ's obedience and death that is received freely by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Declare the excellencies because we want others to know and to be brought in through the hearing of the gospel, to have the light dawn on them too. That is our joyful calling in Rafiki. Some of you on the front lines, some of the rest of us kind of in the back support, but that's our joy, to have light burst in on those who've been in darkness. Finally, finally, you are now God's people. You are now shown mercy. So here is Peter again reminding his, his first audience, remember where you were once you were not a people. Now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Uh, he is echoing unquestionably the prophet Hosea. You remember Hosea's troubled marriage, right? God said to him, marry a woman who's coming out of prostitution and will leave you and go back into prostitution. And name your children names of great sorrow of a husband whose heart is broken by an unfaithful bride. Call your, call your daughter Lohu Hama, not shown mercy. Call your second son Lo Ami, not my people. That's what God says. That's God's command to Hosea. And we read Hosea and we begin to think, can this marriage be saved? Right? Not just Hosea's marriage, but the Lord's marriage to his people, his bride. And then we read Hosea chapter, chapter 1, verse 10. Right after he has said to Hosea, call that boy lo ami, not my people. Then God says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured. And in the place where it was said to them, Lo, Ami, you are not my people. It shall be said to them, children of the living God. In the midst of that word of judgment, here's a word of hope. And of course, what Peter does is he applies what God said to his covenant people, Israel, who had so severely broken covenant, to us who once upon a time had not been in any covenant with God other than the covenant with Adam that Adam broke and we broke in Adam. We weren't connected to God. And Peter says, remember, you once were not connected to God. You weren't a people. But now you are the people of God. So the story of Hosea's wrecked marriage, almost wrecked, Israel's wrecked marriage to her husband, Redeemer, Peter says it applies to us all. To his original audience with their shameful past and sensuality and idolatry, and it applies to law-abiding Jews who kept lots of commands but did so for their own sake rather than out of love for God, and even to us Christians who have wrestled with guilty consciences over past sins, now you are the people who have received mercy. Listen to this. God says, you are my people. You are my people. Through God's mercy in Christ, whose blood has redeemed us from sin's guilt and penalty and sin's controlling power. Here is who you really are. We are God's people, the chosen of the Lord. You sang it earlier this afternoon. Born of God's spirit, established by his word. Our cornerstone is Christ alone, and strong in him we stand. Oh, let us live transparently and walk heart to heart, and hand in hand. Who are we? Who are we, by grace, God's people, chosen in mercy to be his treasured possession, redeemed by the infinitely more precious blood of Christ, Peter says in the first chapter, far more valuable than mere gold, redeemed by the precious blood of his Son, being made holy, subjectively, 
as the Spirit has set us apart, but it's a process to make us actually internally holy, but the Spirit will not let go. He'll keep doing that. And we are eager to broadcast the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are God's people. Praise the Lord.